Welcome to the Future of Mental and Behavioral Health. I'm Bambi Francisco Roizen. I'm the founder and CEO of Vader, one of the hosts and producers of this annual event. This is our fourth year. And before we take a deep dive into this topic, I wanna to take a moment of gratitude. So it seems appropriate that we focus on gratitude. And we all know the science of gratitude, how daily thoughts of gratitude can release these happiness hormones like oxytocin and dopamine and serotonin. So right now, take this moment and, and think about something or someone you're thankful for. Well, I'm thankful for the audience. I'm thankful that you took this time to join us and um, take part in this conversation, this very important conversation. I'm thankful for my co-hosts. You'll meet them shortly. And I'm thankful for our sponsors. So let me run through them. BetterHelp, which is a leading provider of virtual therapy sessions. Alan Matas has been supporting this event well before COVID, well before anyone thought that uh, telehealth really existed and mental health was something that we really needed to take seriously. And um, Octave Health, which is a provider also of virtual therapy sessions, but as well in-person therapy sessions. And with Octave Health, your insurance company can probably cover it. And Neuroflow, which is a provider of collaborative care management. It's a collaborative care management platform. And our longstanding standing advisor, advisor, which is an, is an advisory consulting firm, Stratpoint, which is a uh, outside outsourced engineering firm, and Scrubbed, which is a an outsourced uh, bookkeeping firm. So if you need an outsourced engineering firm or outsourced bookkeeping firm, then you should um, email me at bambi at vader.tv and I will make an intro to Stratpoint and Scrubbed. So thank you to all the sponsors for making these opportunities and making this opportunity a reality. Um, and this is one of my favorite topics. And it's not because we're just talking about innovation um, around mental and behavioral health and what to invest in, but because this is a discussion about how we are reorienting our approach to healthcare away from sick care, away from acute care and toward self-care. And self-care is a term that I've started to embrace. Um, I heard it from Dan Party, and you'll hear from Dan later on this afternoon, but I think it's a really good term um, that represents where, this, where our industry is going. And this, dis this discussion is also about a cultural paradigm shift. And honestly, it's a, it's a new way of looking even at our human nature. And that's why I find this such a fascinating topic uh, in conversation. On this note, I wanna put a plug in for an event that uh, Vader will be hosting with the Lincoln Network. It will be in Miami on October 21st. And the title of this event is Culture, Religion and Technology. It will be a live event in Miami, and I will be having a two-hour discussion with Peter Thiel um, to talk about a, a, a number of topics. So if you're interested in that, join Vader, and you will get alerts um, about that event, as well as another one we're, we're hosting with UCSF Health Hub at UCSF, and Mark can talk about a little bit about that. So with that, let me turn to my co-host, one of my co-hosts, Dr. Arshana Dubé. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Bambi. Um, you know, I'm, I'm personally looking forward to uh, this um, mental and behavioral health conference. This has been our blockbuster event for, gosh, since 2017 onwards. So um, quite interested in the growth that we've had, quite in interested to talk about the maturity of the space and the challenges that we have faced through the pandemic time. Um, in this agenda that we are looking forward to, we have four panels and we would like to try to stick to the 
the focus, focus of discussion for each of these individual panels. So the first one is focused on um, business models in mental behavioral health space. Second one, one, we are focused on the VC investment. Third, we are focused on efficacy and utilities and the role of physicians and clinicians in this space. And then the fourth panel, we are focused on lifestyle, and how four pillars of health can influence to make a big difference. Um, I'm hoping that you are able to hear me well. Um, and because I was hearing a tiny bit echo, but um, I hope we, were, we, we can all dive in into each one of these panels. I'm looking forward to a good discussion on this panel around business modeling and, um, and of course, mental behavioral health. On to you, Mark, who is a third partner in crime here. Uh, go on. Uh, Arshana, thank you. Bambi, always a pleasure. Um, for those who, who haven't been um, at any of Vader's uh, uh, mental behavioral health conferences before, they were doing this before it was in vogue. Um, you know, if you think of the la in the last four or five years and the billions of dollars that have gone into uh, mental and behavioral health, and then uh, what happened with COVID and how it all got accelerated. Well, Bambi and Arshana have been thinking about this for a long time, and I've been part of these uh, these discussions. And uh, so they are really the pioneers uh, in this. And so from a, a UCSF uh, Health Hub perspective, it's an absolute pleasure um, to be a part of the program. I'm gonna show you a few screens that uh, basically tell you, for those who are not familiar with uh, UCSF Health Hub, it's sort of what we do and uh, uh, might be helpful. Now, I'm a volunteer at UCSF Health Hub. Uh, we are funded by the venture capital community. We're affiliated with UCSF. Um, about 20 venture firms uh, fund Health Hub, and our job is to help companies scale and grow. Um, how do we do this? Well, we do this based on the, the fact that we're sitting in, in what we feel is the uh, center of um, healthcare and healthcare innovation worldwide. Um, in San Francisco at Mission Bay. Um, we run a number of programs at, um, at Mission Bay. We have, we probably over the past year have had 25 or so webinars. Um, we now have almost 20,000 people that are either subscribers or members um, at Health Hub. So if you're a company out there and you wanna uh, scale and grow, you wanna meet people, advisors, investors, and find out more, join us. Um, we have two uh, products, uh, one of which is called Health Hub Connect, and that is our sort of match.com platform where we'll connect early stage companies. And these are companies typically pre-validation, um, definitely pre-Series A, that are looking for investors or advisors or clinicians or uh, form some type of clinical trial. Um, in a given week, we'll make dozens of these introductions, and a lot of them have uh, really led to uh, quite a bit of uh, fundraising and money and, and whatnot. Uh, just go to our website and sign up as a member of uh, UCSF Health Hub Connect and you'll find out all about it. The second thing that we're doing and we're going to be announcing next week, our third annual, um, what's now called the UCSF Health Awards Show. Um, we've done it the past two years. Last year, we had a, over a thousand uh, companies submit uh, to win these awards. Um, our sponsors include uh, all the leading uh, big pharma companies and uh, banks and uh, venture firms. And um, if, you have, if you're a company and your product is in market and you've been validated, you should apply to win one of the, uh, our awards. We have this year 18 categories and we're going to be uh, announcing also a special pavilion at the health show, um, which is uh, two weeks after our um, grand finale on October 7th. Um, that is uh, a little, my, my sort of picture on, uh, on what we're doing at, uh, at Health Hub. And I'm gonna come back and uh, give it to Arshana and uh, everyone uh, stay in your seats. This is gonna be a great event. Uh, they really have uh, worked very hard in putting together some of the best of the best of the industry here. So I'm looking forward to it. And I get to uh, host um, a, uh, demo day type of uh, event at 2.30. So for those of you who are back and up on it and come back, I'll be back at 2.30 and uh, with some great companies. Arshana, turning back to you. Thank, thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, I, I truly enjoyed the award show last year. 
Um, there's a lot of good participants in that. So thank you for sharing the UCSF award show and hub. Um, so Bambi, shall we start a little short presentation, which is just kind of going over the state of affairs in mental behavior health. And then we go forward with our discussion with our panelists. Sounds great. Okay, let me share my screen. And so hopefully everybody can see my screen. My screen. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yes. Great. yes. So really quickly, uh, before COVID, mental health was a big deal, uh, but not so much in 1996. In fact, we were spending about $79 billion annually uh, to treat our mental health. This was less than what we spent on heart conditions, which was about 100 billion. But then 10 years later, we ended up evening that out. And then by 2013, spending on mental health was about 25% uh, larger than heart conditions. And one of the reasons there is that we actually had a healthier population. People stopped smoking. Uh, people started living longer. And when they lived longer, that meant that they we had an elder population dealing with some more severe mental health conditions like um, Alzheimer's as well as depression. But something else was happening as well. We had a culture that was uh, focused on or focused on a very reductionist approach toward our mental well-being, um, being very sedated, if you will, on these uh, psychotropics and mood stabilizers. Uh, many of you are very familiar with these names. They became household names. By 2016, one in six Americans were on some sort of antidepressant or anxiety reliever. Um, and then we got a COVID boost. Pre-COVID, one in five people struggled with mental illness. That doubled, that number was two, two in five. Other studies showed that the pandemic actually tripled the number of people suffering from mental illness. And the unfortunate demographic here was uh, the demographic of young adults, 18 to 24. They were considering suicide it was 25% in 2020, double from 2018. So of course, what happened then the mental health drug market expanded again in 2013, one in six, as I, saw, as I showed you, were taking antidepressants. In 2020, this is from Cigna, one in three Americans were taking antidepressants. And these were people who had no history uh, of taking them. So this number is probably, it's probably even more than one in three, but it's not all that bad. There's a silver lining. Um, I think you're muted, Arshana. Yes, yes. Um, I guess I guess it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, let's talk about the silver lining of COVID. Um, and yes, it is true that we we experienced an increase in mental behavioral health issue, but some of that was also almost unmasking of mental and behavioral health issues that probably existed and they were high functional and they were too busy to take care of work in life and didn't address. So there's a lot of complexity that starts to unravel when people did have some time to care for their own mental and mental well-being. We also noticed that there is a ample pro proliferation of both um, the virtual um, virtual care space, adoption by the by the clinician. So less than one percent of doctor visits were video visits in 2019. 75% were video visits. This is adoption by the patient. And then in 2019, we saw only 22% of doctors were equipped or, or were actively using a telehealth type solution. 80% of doctors today, or at least in 2021, and in far more now, um, have telehealth as a norm of care delivery. And if you look at the consumer shifted from 11%, 76% of use of telehealth. And this is not just happening in the physical um, health space, but it, there's a lot more that's happening in the mental and behavioral health space. And you know, our panelists today will kind of vouch for it too. But if you notice, in, in the months <clears throat> preceding, we noticed an uptick on virtual care for both physical and mental health. And as health systems and health centers start to open up, some of the physical health visits start to come back to in-person. 
but that has stayed pretty much plateau for uh, mental and behavioral health space. And so there is adoption in off the virtual space here to stay for a lot of mental behavioral health consumption by the consumers. So as we go forward for the next slide, um, talking about the four pillars of health. Um, as we know that 80% of chronic diseases, you name any, can be influenced by just four choices in our daily routine. And, um, and uh, you know, as Bambi and I discuss very frequently, the chronic disease by definition is shifting into lifestyle conditions or diseases. And if you look at eating well, sleeping well, exercising, and you know, solving for, or I call it positive psychology, but solving for stressors in your life through prayer and meditation um, are already evidence-based tools that um, allow for us to solve for these chronic lifestyle conditions. Yeah, and so I think I would say it another way, our behavior can reduce 80 to 90% of healthcare costs. And that is just fascinating to even think about. So if you think of the average family pays $20,000 annually on healthcare insurance, imagine if they paid only 2,000 annually by reversing conditions, eliminating costly drugs and their side effects and paying for these support teams or coaches and guided meditation, guided activities. So as we, Arshana and I started thinking about how this ecosystem is playing out, I created this, um, this market map. And some of you may have recognized this from several years ago. Um, and you'll notice that um, this line, the y-axis was moved over to the left because there's this growing number of companies that are in the top right quadrant. Now, um, this isn't perfect. So if you see your company there and you're saying, wait, I don't fit there. Um, it's the idea is that um, if you, if you look at the, the X um, axis where we go from clinical all the way to self-actualizing. And then if you look at the Y axis, we go from really specialized clinicians all the way up to pure digital. Um, I think there's a shift in the way, as, as we see these companies emerge, there's a shift in the way we are looking at healthcare away from sick care and beds and meds and toward this new paradigm of self-care and that's why we're seeing all of these companies really moving to the right which is really moving people not just identifying sickness and getting them to baseline resilience but actually moving them along this sort of healthier spectrum um, and that's exciting for us that's the area that we like to look at of course we do have pair therapeutics mind mazes or digital therapeutics and they are going for acute um, symptoms but this is a fascinating, um, this, is a, this is a way we like to look at behavioral mental health and we see a lot of opportunity in lifestyle disease management. Notice we don't say chronic conditions because again, our behavior can eliminate 80% of chronic conditions, but imagine taking that $3 trillion and putting it into lifestyle disease management. And that's what we're seeing. And that's why we're seeing so much money going into this area. And as we look at this, it really is fascinating in terms of how we see the primary care physician um, surrounded by so many tools now to help them manage their um, manage what used to be really a lot of burden on their shoulders. But let me turn this over to the primary yeah. care physician, Arshana, to talk about that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, in the past, when a person would go in um, to see their PCP or primary care physician, they would expect um, some kind of a solution for their, their physical health, some kind of solution for their mental health, and all of these discussions you would have in a certain period of time. That time got shrunk. The number of doctors got shrunk, population increased. So their access to care and access to time with the clinician decreased and the clinician had lesser time with the patient also not digging into a um, great number of solutions. This quadrant used to be quite anemic before because all of that was taken care of by a primary care physician. Imagine you've taken all of those feature sets, so to say, of a, 
uh, for primary care physicians and blew them up into several deep entities, whether it's Verda Health solving for uh, solving and reversing for diabetes, um, whether it is Vita that's providing coaching, whether it's Amada that's helping with weight management, diabetes, musculoskeletal, all of those. These have now almost trying to, these solutions are now trying to make a clinician hopefully give them superpowers to extend them beyond the four uh, wall, brick and mortar wall. And so, so I think it is uh, in a way good if they become easily accessible for both the clinician and, and the patient. So we're able to extend access and, um, and consume healthcare the way in the current times we consume any other industry, whether it's travel industry, financial, everything is in, the, in your hand and your phone. And so all of these companies are enabling that access through the media that you use. So that's, it's a fascinating field and I'm looking forward to all of the individuals who are on our panel to talk more so about how is it going? Yeah, so I'm, it's, uh, I don't know if you guys can see me. Um, for some reason, it seems like my video seems to go off, but, um, but I am here. Can you guys see me? Uh, off and on. Okay, I'm sorry about that. But my... we can hear you, which is a great, which is, which is great. Which is fine. Okay, great. Um, good. Okay. Well, so some housekeeping. Uh, if anyone wants to ask any questions, please use the chat or use the Q&A. Um, we will tee up those questions and we will also uh, hopefully have some time at the end of each panel. Um, and each panel is about an hour. And if you notice in the agenda, we do not have time for breaks. That's for planning on my part. So uh, don't drink any water, anybody. Just stick around for the next four hours. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, okay, with that, it is almost 1130 and we can probably go ahead and, um, and introduce our uh, panelists for the first segment. Um, and firstly, we have to make sure that our panelists are here. Um, I'm not sharing my screen anymore, right? No, sure. you're okay. not sharing. We're, we're back to the panelist mode. Okay. All right. So, so this panel is the business of mental health. What's the cost? Who's paying? And how do you get your mental health services distributed? Again, we're going to try to focus on business models for this one. So, um, and not so much about efficacy and outcomes. We'll be talking a lot to the chief medical officers about that. Uh, so let's kick this off. And um, with everyone introducing yourself, your company broadly, and then one thing personally that you do for your own mental resilience. So how about we start with you, Russ? Uh, sure, thanks so much for having me as always. Great to, great to be here and great to see all these uh, other wonderful panelists here that we have a huge amount of respect for. Uh, I'm Russ Glass, I'm the CEO of Ginger. We are an on-demand mental health system. Uh, we provide 24 seven real-time access to behavioral health coaching. Uh, video-based therapy and psychiatry for those who need that, that higher level of care and uh, self-care exercises for those to be able to, to manage their own conditions with support from their coaches and their other providers. And my, uh, my self-care hack, I guess, is that I try to do, uh, you know, I've got 10 one-on-ones a week and I try to do half of them while I'm walking. So I, I, you know, have an alternating schedule of Zoom calls and then walking calls where I put my headphones in and, and just get outside and get fresh air and get the exercise. And it, I find that not only does it help me, you know, think better while I'm walking, but I sleep better at night on, on the days when I've had those, you know, those jaunts outside. That's great. I just went for my walk this morning too. Had to get that one in. Uh, Sandeep. 
Sandeep Acharya, founder and CEO of Octave Health, in the interest of, of sort of naming technical challenges, the virtual background manages to eat my face. So you're going to have to see my 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 my, my background. But but thank you all for having me here today. Uh, I'll go in reverse order. Um, so my hack, not surprisingly, in times of distress, I have a therapist I can call, and on an ongoing basis, there's a coach I work with. And when I think about why we find it Octave, it's it's a privilege that I have that a lot of folks aren't afforded. Um, one in two folks uh, who are therapists do not accept insurance. Um, and in the markets that we serve in California, New York, the number according to our research is two in 10. And so what we are doing is we're providing high quality therapy and coaching in network. And um, we've helped square the gap um, by uh, working with payers, being accountable for outcomes for the, the mental health services we provide and look forward to sharing more about that. Great. And then I see Alexi. Hi, thanks for having me and thanks uh, to all the other panelists for joining. This will be a fun conversation. Uh, similar to Russ, ton of respect for what everyone here has built and the mission we're all supporting collectively. Uh, I'm Alexi, I'm one of the co-founders of, of BetterUp. Uh, for me, it's, it's working with a coach. I think uh, it's hugely beneficial, been a game changer in my life and something that I've continued to do. I, I actually need so much help that I work with three coaches. Um, but it's something that I've been able to build into my cadence of, you know, my approach to work and life. And um, I think one of the cool things um, with BetterUp is I'm able to do that across different domains from sleep to nutrition to leadership in a really fluent, easy um, way. So it's been a total game changer for me. And a little bit about BetterUp. Yeah. So BetterUp is, you can think of it as um, really a comprehensive platform to help um, people self-actualize and achieve peak performance. Um, so we do that predominantly through coaching and counseling, ranging from a host of areas where we support the whole person from leadership development, all the way to um, mental, um, all the way to what we're calling mental fitness. Um, but you can think of that really as the intersection of resilience and self-actualization to sleep, to nutrition, to things like parenting. So really focused on mainly the subclinical dimension of, men, of mental health and how we can help people flourish at scale. Great. And Alex. Sure. Hey, everyone. Um, I'm Alex Katz, the founder and CEO of Two Chairs. Uh, we are a hybrid uh, outpatient mental health system serving the state of California, focused uh, today on individual and couples therapy, and ultimately building really incredible therapeutic relationships. Um, my kind of mental health uh, hack is, is a therapist. Um, I think as probably many of folks on the panel can attest to, the, the journey of being a founder is a challenging one. Uh, it comes with a lot of ups and downs. And I think a therapist for me has been a really, really essential tool and partner in navigating the journey. Great, thank you. And then Alon. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Alon Matas, I'm the founder and president of BetterHelp. Um, I got into this field, I'm not coming from health or mental health originally, but got into this field by uh, looking for help for myself eight years ago, uh, finding out how difficult and challenging that is, which kind of surprised me. And that's when we started uh, BetterHelp in 2013. Um, we're taking a very traditional approach. We're not trying to disrupt therapy. We're making a platform to connect people with licensed uh, therapists for therapies that is provided online over video, chat, phone, or asynchronous messaging. We have a network of over 18,000 licensed therapists and we make around 5 million counseling interactions uh, every month. Uh, as for a personal mental health hack, I'm not sure I have one, maybe spending time with my girls. I have three of them uh, and they're in different ages, like seven, 12, and 16. So I get a, a good variety of, of both challenges, but a lot of things that are definitely can be considered as mental health boosters. Alan, you've been with us, I guess, the last four years supporting this. And every time, every year, your numbers get bigger and larger. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice to hear. So, um, so my mental health hack is I wake up in the morning and I turn on worship music and I take out my yoga mat and I do yoga and stretching. And I actually do prayer for about 30 minutes. And um, it's really, really some time alone and time to be grateful. Um, and then I also speak to Arshana, who is my therapist. <sighs> Only kidding. <laughs> I could, I, I can be your sounding board though, and you could be mine. But um, my personal uh, mental hack is uh, Stanford Dish. 
every morning, 6 a.m., generally like 5, 50 a.m., I'm sneaking in trying to push the door open so, so I could see the first coyote or first uh, deer, like most, most wildlife that I've seen in the whole country <laughs> is on Stanford Dish. Um, and during, during that, I connect with nature, I connect with the trees, the elements, and then sometimes I listen to really good books that are focused on either new ideas like humor at workplace or uh, just, just a very spiritual grounding books. Um, so so it's, it's my time, me time. I start the day like that and it gets me two for one in a way. So, so with that, I would like to start... Um, you know, asking each one of you, because it's like, this is the big field of mental behavioral health, and there's so many solutions that are unique and, and different. And I want to understand what's your secret sauce, each of these individual platforms, what's your key differentiator? So Russell, I will, again, begin with you, because you're on the top of my screen, but I'll go down, <laughs> down the list, and this my shuffle up. I would say we've got three core uh, differentiators when we look at what's out there. The first is the notion of real-time access to our behavioral health coaches. So, you know, 24-7, if you have a need, you, it could be in the middle of the night, you're having trouble sleeping, you're having a panic attack, you're you're just anxious about something that's that's going on in your life, you're, not, you're feeling depressed, whatever it happens to be, we are there for you. In fact, we've got a great story with Delta Airlines where a flight attendant was having a panic attack on a flight because someone wouldn't put their mask on. They went to the back, they downloaded their Ginger app, they connected with our coach during the flight, they went back to a baseline uh, with some uh, exercises that the coach worked with them on and they were able to go back to work all, all within 10 minutes. And, and that kind of power uh, of access is critical. I'd say two, it is the fact that we start everybody at the behavioral health coaching level. So, so those coaches are determining just how much care does somebody need in addition to being longitudinal care providers. And it turns out 80 plus percent of our members can be handled at that subclinical level. For those who need more care, the third differentiator is we're collaborative. We don't refer out to therapists or refer out to a network of psychiatrists. We bring them into the care team. So now you've got a therapist and a coach. You have a therapist, a psychiatrist and a coach if medication management's needed. And that right level of care in a team environment leads to better outcomes. And we step people down out of that higher level of care as soon as possible. So those licenses can go to support the others in, in the world that, that need them, right? Uh, and we go back to coaching for longitudinal care and making sure we don't have recidivism. That model I think is, is quite differentiated in, in the world of uh, mental health support. It's highly scalable and it's, it's cost effective. So can I ask a follow-up question on um, two things? One is what is your coaching largely live coaching or is that a combination of digital and live? And then second is how do you build intelligence in are you building some kind of a data intelligence around who is matched with the right kind of care? Good questions. A hundred percent of our coaching is live. It's real, real time coaching, doing synchronous care. Mm -hmm. okay. And that synchronous care is uh, all done by a chat today. So, you know, basically you're, you're using call, think of it like a HIPAA compliant Facebook messenger kind of an experience. Those coaches bring in exercises, they bring in activities, they, uh, they and the system itself per, quote unquote prescribes what would be the most relevant content, what would be the most relevant experience for those members. And to get to your second question, we do that with quite a bit of machine learning. So we are, we are monitoring those chats again in a privacy sensitive way. We're extracting key features understanding the background, the history, comorbidities, medications, tone of voice even. Mm -hmm. We take that information along with scores, PHQ, GAD, resilience scores, five-star rating scores, and we personalize a care pathway. And so what we're doing is giving the coach real-time understanding of what is the next best action? What is the predicted path for this member to get them healthy as fast as possible? 
Uh, we're looking at things like risk, so suicide risk. We're looking at you know what might be a requirement for an escalation from that coach. But then we're also making those coaches more scalable. We're automatically summarizing notes for them so they don't have to take their own notes. We are providing smart replies. So with one click, a coach can respond with the predicted best response. And again, all of that helps us scale and take the cost out of care while creating a more personalized care experience for our members. Nice. Um, thank you so much. So a similar question for you, Alex, because um, you're next on my screen. Uh, what are your key differentiators compared to your fellow um, solutions here? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think for us, it's really all about creating the absolute best therapeutic relationships. And, you know, we know from the research, the clinical alliance between a therapist and a client, it's ultimately by far the best predictor of outcomes in care. And so for that reason, we have put our matching system really at the heart of our care model. And we've spent the last four years honing and iterating on that model. Um, and it really emphasized, uh, emphasizes collecting a ton of data from clients, both digitally, but also in the context of a 45 minute matching appointment in person with a licensed clinician. And then we're using all of that information and data to make super personalized matches. Um, the impact of that match is that folks are dramatically more likely to initiate care, to complete a course of treatment, and ultimately, we see much higher alliance scores um, and much improved, you know, uh, symptom, uh, symptom improvement, that sort of thing. Um, and what that matching system relies on is building an exceptional clinical team. So we made the decision from day one to full-time employ almost all of our therapists. And we're putting a ton of time into vetting those folks, training those folks. It's a profoundly diverse team in terms of training, theoretical orientation, background, identity, and that diverse, strong team enables us to make um, really strong therapeutic matches. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, Sandeep, you're next on my. Just a, a comment that I think uh, should be said here is that we're not as focused on being different from others on the screen. I think collectively, we are trying to increase access in the mental health system and the majority of mental health is delivered by single shingles and we're all on the side of trying to you know, improve and expand access. And, a number of folks in this industry have been helpful to us as we kind of yeah. progressed. But I'd say our focus has been on, on sort of two things. One is focus on outcomes ultimately um, and, and betting on the notion that providers who, who have been trained in evidence-based modalities um, and uh, have a focus on using measurement in their care can ultimately drive better outcomes. I think the second piece here is we target a slightly more acute population because we have been accepting insurance um, for the last few years. So about a half to two thirds of our population is dealing with mild, sorry, moderate to severe levels of acuity. And so the focus on evidence-based treatment and the focus on outcomes is ultimately how we're gonna focus on long-term differentiation, just building a data set that demonstrates we're, at, we're providing efficacious treatment is critical and then, and then doing it with some level of efficiency for payers. So for folks that we think are coming in with mild to subclinical uh, needs, we are routing to, to coaching where possible because we think that's actually a better match. Um, and so coming from primary care, I, I have a, a value-based orientation and we're thinking about it very similarly in mental health. Excellent, thank you. And um, Alan? Yeah, uh, first of all, I, I, I can some deep, like it, this, it's not a competition. Uh, and I think we're, we're all like the same goal. We, we took it from different approaches. So, you know, some uh, more subclinical, more clinical. We, we focus obviously on the, on the uh, clinical side. Uh, um, it's all licensed therapists and, and traditional therapists. Maybe our, our differentiator is that we're uh, purposely not trying to be innovative, uh, which means we're, we're trying to bring the trident to uh, science of, of therapy but we're trying to make it uh, more affordable, more accessible to people that don't get care because the, the biggest problem uh, is not necessarily that the care uh, that, you know, that has been offered is not good. It's good, it's just most people, uh, the vast majority of people that need it, they're not using it uh, because it, it's so difficult and, and so expensive. So this is really what we're, uh, we're trying to change. Um, I would say that on, on the differentiator, some things are just um, sheer factor of size and scale. Uh, and if we take, uh, as an example, uh, our provider network, when you have close to 20,000 active therapists, that means that we can match uh, an Alex talked about matching. 
we can match uh, a person to the best therapist for that person, which is not necessarily the best therapist because it's, it's such a personal experience in, in the so much nuance on people's needs and, and, um, and demographics and preferences. And we ha when you have such a large network, then you can do uh, just statistically a much better job in, in, in finding the right care and the right, uh, the right provider that would create the right al alliance with, uh, with a member uh, uh, for this. So that's, that's just something that comes. Of course, we build all the, all the systems around it and we'll not say AI because it's becoming a cliche, but obviously there, there's some components of that, but just uh, by uh, the brute force of, of size and scale that makes us a differentiator. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I like that statement. It's like we are, our, our differentiator is we are not innovative. <laughs> it's kind of an interesting twist to this. Amazing. Um, Alexi, um, can you share uh, your differentiator? Sure. Well, I'll just, at the risk of beating a dead horse, I'll just reiterate. I don't, I think differentiation is the total wrong framework mm -hmm. uh, to think about it. I think this is about uh, huge swaths, literally seven, almost seven billion people who don't have access to real mental health care, yeah. right? By modern yeah. standards, if you take a global population. Um, so can I, can I rephrase the question? I would say, what's your approach, which is unique in, in this? Sure. You know, I, I guess like as a clinician, one pill doesn't work for everyone. I could take yeah. a blood pressure pill that doesn't work, then I have to move it around. And so what, what I'm looking at, all of these solutions, they're not fit for everyone. And so, yes, so we call it differentiator, but that's unique approach that you have. Yes. Sure. Right. Yeah. So I, look, I think, you know, we, i we may be the odd man out here, so to speak. Right. So I think to, to piggyback off Russell's stat, which he cited, you know, in, in their data, 80% of folks, their, their, uh, need or opportunity to grow can be addressed with coaching. And I think, you know, that's the insight we built better up off. We really think of ourselves as the top of the funnel for most people's experience with mental health. Um, the reality is most people don't need therapy. And um, I think probably what's most unique to our approach is we don't think it's productive to tell most people they need therapy, um, nor do we think it's realistic to say that we could give most people therapy at a global level, um, nor should that be desirable that most people would need therapy. Um, if we really were good at prevention, most people wouldn't need therapy by definition. And so um, I think we kind of turn the equation on its head and say, well, what do you have to get really good at? If you re-envision therapy as it really was designed, which is to be secondary care, not primary care, then what would be primary care? What well, would be coaching? It would be evidence-based, informed by things like third wave CBT and some components of DBT and probably things like, you know, from Frankel to Maslow and the human potential movement from Martin Seligman and Mihai Czech Mihai and positive psychology, right? It would, it, would, it would be better up, we would say. And so what we've tried to build is to be, have that fidelity to the intellectual tradition and say, hey, for most people, if I took a person off the street, what would be the best concoction or mix for them? It would be something that's really in the ilk of positive psychology, focus on strengths, focus on self-actualization, focus on resilience and well-being. And what we built in then is really rigorous triage and escalation paths for the small percent of people who do have acute mental illness and do need to partner with folks like you on the clinical side. And we want them to get that care. But we know statistically that's not most people. And so as we think about better up, I think you can think of us and, and this panel in a positive way as the odd person out that we're really focused on how do you get really good at coaching? And if you're really focused on coaching, then it's not just behavioral health coaching. How do you intersect that to people's career aspirations? How do you intersect that into their family dynamics? And how do you bring the same heavyweight of academic research many of you all do at the clinical side to the non-clinical realm? And so that's where we've tried to specialize as a company and bringing clinical rigor and research to the non-clinical domain, which traditionally has kind of been left scarily to like self-help gurus, right? Which is when you think about this as part of mental health becomes a very scary thought to think that most people's experience latently with mental health is like a self-help book if we're really being honest. And so we're trying to up the game of science, intelligence, data, but also integrity and outcomes on that side of the spectrum. That's excellent. Right. Bambi, back to you. Alexi is bringing humanistic psychology into the modern times, right, Alexi? Um, it needs an upgrade for sure. Yeah, that's what we're, I mean, that's what we're trying to do. 
it does need an upgrade. And I think everyone here on this panel also is upgrading from, I think everyone saw the slide. Well, hopefully you saw the slide circa 2000 where we had a society that was just basically self-medicating. So I think everyone here is moving away from that paradigm. So a question regarding, um, and this is to all of you, but I'll start with you, Alexi, because um, I think we had a conversation before where it was difficult to get people to start thinking in that way because we've been so focused on finding a sickness and only doing something on when we're sick. So how is your how is your customer base and people you're in, interacting with, how are they seeing this, accepting this new paradigm of care? Yeah, I think, you know, we were chronologically pretty early. Um, you know, we started the company in 2013 and we had this great heroic idea that you know, everyone will flock to this idea of you have a therapist as well as a coach and we're supporting the whole person and you can do it all with better up. And what we realized is, um, especially at that time to most people that was really stigmatizing and a turnoff. And so I think for us, we realized if we really want to focus on that top of the funnel, um, we need to try to focus on what are the frustrations and what are the aspirations of people who don't have acute mental illness and how do they think about getting help and care and take them on a journey that can lead the right people to therapy at the right time. Um, but by framing it, sadly, in our cultural dialogue, especially things have changed in 2013, I'd say things have changed, I'm sure we'd all say in the past two years due to COVID, but especially back then we realized we weren't doing our user or ourselves favor by branding as mental health because for people that literally just meant the removal of mental illness. And so to kind of try to asterisk that and be like, well, yes, but it's a spectrum. And we also mean the creation of strengths and flourishing to the average user was just too much. And so uh, we really branded as coaching. And what we did was, what we did was mental health. What we did was resilience, stress, anxiety, mild depression. We, we did all the same stuff we were already doing, but by focusing it on performance, on leadership, on promotion, on the outcomes people want when they want to be healthy, we found that the use and adoption was off the charts. And so um, I think there's a famous behavioral economics marketing study. Do you put the health in front of anything, adoption just goes down, right? We know that, right? So um, we really lived that. And, and so we leaned hard on, hey, if health is the expression of vigor and vigor is the root of performance, really, why not just make this about performance? Why make this about health for our population? Of course, if you're doing a clinical population, that would be disingenuous to say it's not mental health. But for our population, why, why burden it when he with health? Why not make this about what folks want from health, which is they want peak performance, they wanna be happy, they wanna be great at their life and their jobs. And so for us, that's really how we've been framing and approaching for the years. Now, post COVID, we're starting to really get loud about the clinical side because we have a large population, we have that too, but we're more backing into that than leading with that. And Russ, the majority of your providers are coaches and did you get a lot of pushback and how are your how are um, employees perceiving your product today a couple of thoughts one is it's actually uh, not accurate to say the majority of providers are coaches the majority of our providers are actually clinical uh, they're actually therapists and psychiatrists we can just handle far more people with coaching and with coaches. It's a far more efficient vehicle for delivering care. We bring in those therapists and psychiatrists as needed. There's also, you know, getting into the weeds of this space, but once you get into that clinical level of care, you need state licensure. And so that just requires more of them than you need when you can deliver care across state boundaries and, and country boundaries, really, um, where we're delivering care in 49 countries now. The, 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 you know, back to the core point of this panel, right? What, what we see is that somebody who's got a mental health condition is going to cost the overall healthcare system two and a half X more than somebody who doesn't have those issues. And, and we also see that as it gets more and more serious, cost goes up. So you can actually look at the PHQ-9 scale. And as you go higher on that scale, you go all the way to six times more expensive to the healthcare system. If, you're, if you've got SMI. So you have a huge cost to the system. You have a system that doesn't have enough people to deliver care. And 
on the front end of that, you, you, you've got stigma, which, which Alexi was talking about. You've got stigma, which prevents people from starting early enough. They don't get into care until they're feeling pretty darn acute, until they're feeling pretty darn bad. And our, our contention is that, hey, we've got to start earlier. We've got to make access easier. It has to get less expensive to start that journey because you want to prevent as many people as possible from needing clinical care in the first place. There will always be plenty to support the businesses you see here that are clinical in nature, right? But, but you want the right people going to those businesses. You want the people that need therapy. You want the people that need psychiatry to get to that level of care. And you want the ones that can be handled with less expensive resources, more scalably, uh, with, with less intense interventions to be handled at a lower cost. And, and that's, that's what, our, what we're trying to do. We're trying to change the model so that you really optimize the level of licensure you're using. You optimize the cost so it's much lower to handle the vast majority of people. And, and then when needed, when needed, you get people to that higher level of quality care and you step them down as soon as you can out of that higher level of care. Right, right. Yeah, and, and I think that I think everyone is shaking their head. Sandeep is shaking his head that yes, we don't want to push people into acute care. We want to take, we want to be very preventative about this. And uh, I'll get to you, Sandeep, but but Alon, because you have, um, I mean, I don't know how old BetterHelp is now, but you have tens of thousands of therapists, and you your different approach because yours are therapists, not coaches. But I see that a lot of people you know, see your ads everywhere. And they're probably thinking, you know, they're probably not all clinically depressed. Um, you know, they're probably thinking that they just want to talk to a therapist. And maybe they think a therapist is, is, a, um, is equivalent to a coach, right? Somebody that they could just talk to. Is, are your, are the, the people using your consumers, users, are they really, you know, clinically, um, you know, have some sort of clinical diagnosis Diagnosis, or are they just average people sort of seeking some, or the term languishing, are they just languishing and just seeking some baseline resilience? Yeah, I, th I think there, the, there is some misconception around therapy, like you don't need to be severely depressed or uh, in a um, clinically diagnosed uh, disease in order to benefit from therapy. Uh, therapists are helping in a very wide spectrum of uh, of situations and uh, everyone with uh, significant challenges, which is a lot of people, uh, can definitely benefit from uh, from therapy. The, the coach versus uh, therapist is, is always kind of a, a murky line. Um, you know, when uh, what is a line of coaching? What is a line of, of therapist from both legal, ethical point of view, but also from uh, quality and in an impact. Um, point of view. I think a lot of the um, um, appealing factor in, in coaching, uh, if, if we're all honest, is also cost. The, the, uh, the fact that coaches are uh, less expensive and less in demand and, and more scalable, also from a state line point of view, but also from uh, just uh, inventory point of view than, uh, than therapists. Um, but we, we, should not, uh, we, we should not be confused if someone needs a, th a therapy uh, or counseling, they need to see a therapist. They shouldn't be seeing a coach. And, and that's, a, that's a very, very tricky line uh, to handle. And there are no, there's no definite truth. Like when does it come between, uh, where's the line between performance improvement and just generally feeling happier to, uh, uh, to therapy? I think we should err on the side that uh, um, on, on providing the best care possible. And, and that here today is, is therapy. Um, I, I, I want to push back on that a little bit. I, I agree with a lot of what you said. If somebody needs therapy, they absolutely need therapy and we want to make sure they get there. But the notion that it's a murky line is, I think, antiquated. Yeah. I, I think that maybe a decade ago that was true. I think that it is highly data-driven at this point. We know very specifically, in fact, our systems can predict when somebody is gonna cross that line into needing the interventions that a licensed therapist can provide versus interventions that a coach can provide. And so I think, I, I really believe in order to scale care in this country, 
we have to be more careful about making sure that those therapists that have the level of licensure that they have and have the ability to provide interventions that are licensed interventions are being used for the people that need them. And then you use the coaches for the ones that don't. And, and you know, we, we have now published and peer reviewed results that show coaches are just as effective at driving PHQ down, at driving GAD down, at driving resilience up as therapists when appropriately used, when used for the right level of care and level of need. And, and so I don't, I don't think it's murky anymore. Yeah, I, I wanna jump in. This is a, this is a good uh, uh, kind of discussion. Um, I, I think it's not just cost, it's also a function of access, right? We just articulated how it's between 50 and 100 million Americans who have a, a, a need. And so we don't have enough licensed providers to address all of that. With that said, um, I think, I don't think any of us know because we're targeting such different populations. I wish we could stare at the full data set of, of Americans to understand truly what portion of the population needs therapists versus coaches. I suspect it's gonna be somewhere between your respective answers, right? 80% needs coaching and none of them need coaching. Um, and I think it's our collective duty to figure out how large we can make that so we can drive greater efficiency and help more people, less putting costs aside. And part of the reason that I think we have the imperative is Although Russ cited some stats around cost reduction, I do think it's also true that people need mental health support, whether or not there's a accompanying medical condition or opportunity for cost in the system. And frankly, the problem is that we just need more investment in behavioral health, period, because it's the right thing to do. Um, and given that, how can we use it most efficiently? And I would just state, you know, um, this is an area of, of challenge I think we're all gonna be wrestling with. Uh, you know, our own data doesn't suggest it's 80%, I hope it is. Um, but maybe the folks that we're targeting have a higher acuity level. Um, and that's part of how we think about it. And just last thing I'd state is there was, a, I think the, the nominal entry point for this was how do you think about preventative services? And I would just state that this market, this segment is so large. When we started, just to show you how little I know, I thought we were going to be able to kind of combine classes and preventative services with therapy and quickly, quickly realize that these are very different populations um, that need these different levels of support. And we decided early on to focus on true clinical need um, in, our, in our service offerings and offer really good quality care for that clinical need. So. so also, yeah populations, and maybe this is to Alex and Sandeep as well, how do you get that funnel? Where, where do you get the people who need the coaching and then and then the handoff to you? How do you, how do you find them? How yeah, do you it's, it's interesting. You know, for the most part, I think Alex and I have a similar answer. We're trying to work with primary care doctors and, and, and physicians, right, um, to identify the opportunity uh, to help folks. I think you tend to see more acuity in those, in those populations. I think just by nature of the fact that we're um, offering insurance, that we're taking insurance, we're working with people who may have less options um, uh, to, to provide care, and therefore it's, it is slightly more acute than prior. We weren't always uh, accepting insurance. Prior to um, uh, working with Anthem, we were cash pay and we did see lower acuity. So I just think by virtue of, of the way that we're operating, we're seeing higher acuity. Yeah, it's just one thing I wanted to add about therapy versus coaching. Uh, we can ignore the fact that therapy is very well defined and also regulated. And I think regulation is important where coaching is undefined and un unregulated. Uh, and it, and that's, that's a very uh, clear line. In order to be a therapist and to provide therapy, you need to go some education, certification, uh, training, uh, internships, and, and uh, every two years to go through a bunch of tests. That's completely does not happen in coaching where it's a free, free for all. Every company would define their own standard, their own vetting. And of course, we'll, we'll say that they're doing a great job. And that, that's a very, very important line to distinguish between a regulated uh, uh, industry that has been around for decades and evolved around the science to something that is unregulated. Uh, and you, the other thing to remember is that every therapist can provide coaching, not every coach, oh, no coach can provide therapy. Uh, so definitely on, on the option of whether you want uh, someone to um, make sort of a bet that yes, we will find the exact point where, uh, you know, it's going from uh, not needing a therapist to needing a therapist and who will make this term determination and based on what, then that's what I'm, I call uh, air on the side of uh, having a therapist. And if it's more on the light side and, and the, um, less severe side, that's that's fine too if it's provided by therapists. Yeah, and, and with yeah, that I, 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 yeah, yeah. yes, go ahead. Oh, go I ahead. was just gonna say, yeah. you know, just on that, 
totally agree. I mean, I think um, it's not it's it's a false choice architecture, though. It's kind of like saying, do you want to go to your general physician or would you like a personal trainer? It's like, well, I, I like both is the answer and both exist. And one is unregulated and one is regulated and both are health. And so I, I totally agree with everything Alon said. I think it's factually very correct. The one point of fact I'd say is so strangely, and this is something that blew my mind in building better up, uh, therapists are significantly cheaper than certified executive coaches by multiple factors, which should not be the case. Maybe we can all argue, but it actually is if you just let the market price elasticity and that's because of HMOs that negotiate therapists down to a fixed rate or TPAs, right? So there's a rack rate for therapists. The average executive coach that is certified is significantly like factors of three to five X more expensive than a therapist per hour. And so um, we can all argue at the end quality of that, but the idea that coaching is cheaper, just as a point of fact, is patently false. Now, there may be a life coach in like Arkansas not wearing pants on a Skype call that's cheaper, but like none of our businesses are using that person, right? And so as we think about, it's not really a cost of goods or a cost of service provided. Um, I think the better analogy is if you need to go, if you're trying to build muscles, you don't really go to your general physician. Maybe you go once and then you go to physical trainer, you go to physical therapy. We have in the physical health system, very complementary solutions that address different acuity of care and they have different cost factors. Um, we don't have that yet in mental health. And so I would just encourage us not to think of what's this false either or choice architecture. And really, I think this, the, the answer is like, how is this comp complementary? How do we provide a continuum of care? And we probably do need to massage some of the cost structures underneath that to enable more mobility of care across. Um, but for us, what we found is um, the user doesn't think of it that way and it doesn't help them to encourage them to think of it that way. Yeah, and, and with, with that thought, you know, both Samalan and um, Alexi, I think it all comes down to who are you, who is your customer? Um, it, it's, it's uniquely important. And for better help, you know, your customer was, was initially to direct to consumer. Um, and, and so the experience is that the consumer is looking for a therapist and it created this market in which you had to become like scale it really fast and have this network of, uh, to address that market. Um, when you're selling to an employer in which you have the full grade of like prevention to, you know, condition management to now like brain, you know, uh, psychological damage kind of situations, a continuum of care, then you're looking at a blend model, which is, which is essentially what Alexi and Russell were talking about. But I wanted to come back to the business modeling aspect and you quickly ask questions and I'm gonna go reverse order at this point to see like who is really your customer, who is paying for your services and how, what is your business model? Um, you know, is that per user per month? Are, are you looking at um, some kind of a case rate? Like, are you going at risk? And like, what is happening in your companies and how are you looking at this market and maybe even disrupting the business models in a way in the Amazon care style. Um, so I'll begin with um, uh, begin with Alex. He's been quiet for a bit. So let's begin from there, yes. Sure, yeah. So at a basic level, we have two customers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a direct-to-consumer side to our business where clients are coming to us directly, they're paying for our services mm -hmm. and we're helping them get out-of-network reimbursement. Um, and then second, we've got payer customers. So mm -hmm. in that context, it's typically a fee-for-service relationship. Um, and look, I think where probably all of us want to go in the long run is to value-based care. And I think we're building our system with that in mind. And we're starting by plugging into healthcare in the way that healthcare wants us to plug in. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Sandeepia, what's your, um, what's your business model? Who are you selling to? And what are the flavors of business model you're toying with? Yeah, we've tried some stuff. So I can, I can share a little bit, you know, yeah. we are... Uh, our, our, you know, dominantly we're, we're getting our reimbursement from payers, um, mm -hmm. but we think of client first in the orientation of, of the company. Um, you know, we currently have fee-for-service arrangements with payers where our premiums are contingent on achieving outcomes. And okay. so we, we do have fees at risk for, um, you know, accomplishing the goals that we set out for our clients. Um, you know, and we, we, I went really far down the path uh, with one major national payer on negotiating episode-based payment 
it's a lot of brain damage and you need to attain a lot of scale. And, it, and I, I think fundamentally, one of the challenges that all of us will struggle with as we think about um, more creative payment structures is look, therapy and coaching. These are services that are very helpful for people in times of need and also when there is not necessarily a clinical need. And um, you know, negotiating for that episode puts you at odds with your client in ways yeah. that are tricky. So my, my aim for now is to focus on outcomes and make sure we get really understand that triaging that Russell and Alexi have data on for their populations. And then long-term, you know, as we get scale, start thinking about ways that we can uh, be more creative with payers. And there's a willingness. So do you do like fee-for-service and performance guarantee type kind of solution? Yeah, fee-for-service yeah. with SLAs basically okay. Okay. Uh, around, around quality um, okay. and other uh, related items. Okay, great. Russell, um, what's happening on your end? Who are you selling? Two core customers, uh, enterprise clients, so large payers, uh, largely self-insured that are trying to provide support for their employees. In that employer world, our models, we have a, a PPM model plus a fee-for-service, so PPM for unlimited access to coaching, content, platform, et cetera, and then fee-for-service for clinical need that gets billed back through their health plan. Uh, we also then launched a value-based model last year where uh, we incorporate all of the um, capabilities from coaching to therapy to psychiatry into a single value-based PPM. And uh, that's been over 50% of our new client acquisition has gone with the value-based model. So clearly a, a model that people are attaching to already. Uh, and then the second large customer base is health plans. And uh, recently we announced uh, our first national payer, Cigna, which is the first national health plan. And I think they'll be speaking later, but, but first national health plan to actually reimburse for coaching uh, uh, with Ginger. And so now, you know, 14 million members are able to access the full spectrum of care. Again, based on their desire to make sure people are getting the right level of care. Uh, as, as cost effectively as possible, but then that ginger is providing navigation to those higher, higher acuity levels of care, both within the ginger system, as well as within the broader Cigna ecosystem when needed. And it, with Cigna, is that like an EAP kind of solution? You're embedded there or you are a fee for service with them? Uh, with Cigna, it's a, it's a utility fee for service based uh, uh, relationship. So anybody that has Cigna coverage can go to my Cigna, download the Ginger uh, app, and and start to get access to care with reimbursement from Cigna. Excellent. Um, Elon, how, how how are things going here? Who are you selling? Yeah, so we're we're uh, predominantly direct to consumer. This is <laughs> this cons and consumer will always be our. Uh, our primary, but whatever channel that may be, uh, this is where we started and this is what we tried to solve. Um, even when you talk about traditional uh, in-office therapy, most people are actually not using their insurance mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons that we can go into, but uh, that's that's a reality. And, and the, our uh, fundamental model is a uh, consumer pays a, a monthly fee around $200, $300 a month uh, where they get uh, a weekly session with a therapist, whether it's for video, phone, or chat with their choice, plus unlimited messaging, asynchronous messaging between uh, these sessions. So there's constant communication, but also the traditional model of uh, 45 minutes uh, weekly session. Uh, over the time, we had a lot of organizations, whether it's employers or universities or uh, EPs, what have you, that can say, we, we want to uh, uh, pay for our population to use uh, to use the service. By the way, a lot of times it just came from someone in the organization that used BetterHelp as a consumer and said, this is something that everybody in my company should have. Uh, and that's how we, we expanded to uh, the B2B market uh, where we have organizations that uh, are paying for uh, their members. But uh, uh, our thinking is always consumer and consumers first. Uh, and if someone wants to sponsor their, their members' um, mental health care and, and wellness, we're always happy to, uh, to help with that. Excellent. Thank you. Alexi? Yeah, so again, we're, we're a little different given our emphasis. So um, we, we, sell, we sell to the company predominantly. Um, we do have a direct-to-consumer business, um, but it's newer. The majority of our revenue comes from enterprise sales. Uh, and 
um, we have a couple different models. Um, because we're selling based on performance, a lot of our buyers are actually the talent side or the line of business side of companies. And so they actually buy on an enterprise SaaS model. So nothing akin to benefits. We do also sell into benefits. Then we use a price per participant per month. We, we just want to charge people for actual usage versus DEPM. Um, so those are, those are essentially in the enterprise, one of the two models, either paying concurrent licenses in the SaaS model or price per participant per month when we sell the benefits. So that's interesting. So you're selling to the talent team or the business vertical in, within the company. Yep. Um, so this is an expense for that business vertical and not so much going through the benefits. Yeah, it's an investment for that business vertical to yeah. increase their performance, right? And I think that's the reframe, right? It's like, we try to askew thinking of this as like entitlement spend mm -hmm. and thinking of this as, hey, the greatest investment you can make is in your people's performance. And what's the greatest rate limiter or acceleration accelerant to their performance? Really right now, their, their clarity of mind, right? Their psychological state, their mental well-being, their resilience, their mental fitness. And so we focus most of our dry powder and our sales and marketing motion on building that case for line of business leaders mm -hmm. and talent that, hey, this is accretive. This is not like an entitlement dollar I was going to spend on healthcare. This is something that, you know what, I was going to spend in something else that generates revenue. I'm now going to spend in my people. Um, so very, just very different sales motion. And now we've gotten the pull into benefits as this, mm -hmm. again, when we started, there wasn't really a budget here and benefits for this. Um, it was like clinical care or kind of nothing. So now there really is, I think, more and more dollars in benefits around well-being and wellness and mental fitness. So we do sell there as well. But it's a it's a growing but much smaller part. The majority of our business is line of business and talent. So quick question on that reporting. So do you report out on performance outcomes for people? Yep. Their career Not growth? individually. Uh, yeah, 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 of course, of course, yeah. yes, population. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, uniquely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the cool things BetterUp does that really no one else mm -hmm. does, which is we connect, We can connect to sales performance, quota attainment, figure out like what is the mindset of the highest performing rep mm -hmm. as a, you know, not an individual, but yeah. as a pro, pro, profile. Yes. Um, we can connect everything from attrition to turnover. We can connect to civic behaviors with, you know, everything from um, to take things like psychological capital and connect that into, you know, collaboration behaviors. We have proprietary research um, with folks like Adam Grant and Martin Seligman on creativity behaviors in the workplace and the psychological leading behaviors of that. So we spend most of our energy and effort on trying to get this to dependent variables of business outcomes because our worldview, and we may be wrong, the time will tell, is that ultimately the CEO owns talent. The CEO, that's that's their job. The CEO owns, you know, ultimately the healthcare of their workforce as well and the health of their workforce. And in, unless we're spending the, speaking the language of CEOs, all of us will always be pigeonholed into this is a benefit or this is something in the healthcare space as opposed to this is something that everyone in the world should be using and they should be using it because it makes them better. Mm. That's, that's very interesting. Um, that's just one thing real quick. Alexi, that's really cool that you do that. I think the yeah. payers themselves are craving that because mm -hmm. they're, they want to invest in behavioral health. And when they go to the employers, just that value proposition to the employers is helpful. So I hope you publish some of that data. It'd be helpful to all of us. We, yeah, we, thank yeah. you. Yeah, we actually just, we are. You, we, we've uh, published a, a bit and we just got another publication accepted last week on this, on coaching, driving. Yeah. similar to, to some of the outcomes Russ mentioned. So Russell mentioned from resilience to a lot of these perform workplace performance outcomes. I think it's, I mean, look, I'm biased. It's a contrarian viewpoint, but like we feel strongly that's the future is it's connecting this back to organizational performance. That's really where the money's going to come from. Well, and I also like it, things that are getting worsened by the pandemic around, you know, women coming back to the workforce uh, because of tremendous impact on, of balancing work life at this point. Like, how do you measure that? And if you're able to provide some measurement of like how you enable people coming back to work and especially in this time where, where we're hoping and trying for it to be a, a healthier, diverse workforce, how do you enable that? So it, that's, that's very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. We have 10 yeah, our pleasure. left and we're probably gonna do some Q and A because we have some questions lined up here, but really quickly for uh, everyone, can you talk a little bit about usage and adoption, maybe at the corporate level too? Um, and then are you thinking, as we think about 
um, this is you know therapy and coaching as sort of wellness and prevention um, to some extent. A uh, I think of a, a personal coach, uh, trainer, a personal trainer. You know, you use a personal trainer for maybe three months, maybe six months, but you don't look at it as a gym membership. Is anyone thinking about how do we get away from this idea of a personal coach for three months or a personal trainer to a gym membership model? So I want to just open that up to anyone. Um, so usage, adoption, and then how are you thinking of sort of making this model more of a, a subscription gym membership model? Yeah, I, I can jump in on that first. I, I think we are trying to move in the opposite direction of this being an ongoing source of spend for the rest of your life. I think, like, look, what is two chairs in a nutshell? We're a clinical organization and we're helping folks that are suffering from mental illness. And I think what our clients and what our payer customers value is us getting folks to symptom remission, getting them to treatment goals, getting them to clinical outcomes they care about. And the more efficiently we can do that, the better for the client, the better for the healthcare system. So I think that that is our orientation. That's how we create value for clients and for healthcare more generally. Any, anyone else want to answer that question? Yeah, I think for, for us, uh, again, the, the consumer is the king like, and, and they will determine uh, how long they want to, to use therapy. And I think the, the approaches are very different. For some people, they come for a very specific need uh, and they need to get over something and they use maybe for a month or two months or three months and, and they they're get on with their life. And, and that's great. Like we're, we're not trying to, we're, we're not the SaaS model where you, you expect 98% uh, annual retention and uh, uh, retention is the only KPI that you're, you're focusing on. People that got into BetterHelp, got the help that they need, uh, feel great, and may come back two years from now when they, they have another challenge. Uh, that's awesome. For some people, they want constant support with a therapist and may stay with, in, in therapy for years and years, uh, and that's, um, uh, that's fine too. And, and I think the, the great thing about being uh, on a DTC model, and, and I get now that we're probably the only uh, DTC, uh, maybe with two chairs actually, uh, the, the DTC uh, focused company is that you, you have to be constantly providing value to each one of your consumers because they're, 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 there's no gateway. There's no like some, someone in the middle that you need to convince. Every one of your consumers have to get value. Otherwise uh, they churn and never, uh, never come back. Yeah, I mean, Bam, I, I love your question. I mean, the original pitch for BetterUp was to build a gym for mental health which ironically would not include clinical care, just like your gym does not include clinical care. So we took it very literally. Um, that continues to be our aspirations. And I, I think it can work. We see it. People would use coaching for years because it's not clinical care. Like I'd be very leery of a general physician. <laughs> it's like, I want to treat you for 10 years for the same condition, right? Unless it's chronic care management. And I think that's the cool thing. It's like, we know how the number line works. Like we know how low you can be from acute mental illness. We know how, how far the negative goes. What we don't know scientifically yet, and Marty would say this, you know, at UPenn, we don't know how positive the number line gets in human flourishing as a species. Like that's the unknown, right? We know how bad, like you can be very, very bad mental health. We know what that looks like. We don't yet add as, we're at the edge of discovery on what does human flourishing really look like? What does peak performance? So I think when you're above zero, the gym metaphor works great because you can spend your whole life. In fact, Maslow would say that is what life is about, pursuing that flow states, pursuing self-actualization as an ongoing inter-decade pursuit. And so that's what we're building better up around. And um, I think if you're doing it from zero to in infinity, it makes a ton of sense. I think if you're a clinical provider, yeah, I share the, the concerns some of you have voiced. It'd be a little odd as a metaphor. If it's like, I'm at negative 10, I'm gonna just be at negative 10 for the rest of my life. So Alexi, can you talk about adoption then at the corporate level? Very different. I'd say it's almost not fair to compare because we are focused often on very specific populations when we do these line of business and talent deployments. And so our adoption is like 90%, right? Our monthly actives are in the 60s, 70s. But again, that's part of it is it's framed aspirational. It's framed as like, we believe in you. We want to see you continue to perform and grow. Um, so it's very different than like, hey, you have this thing available in your portal that if you have an issue, you can go to. Um, when we do the benefits deployments, we're in the 15 to 20%, right? At the population level, um, which is high, but you know, not like I would say high end of industry standards. Um, but for most of our talent and line of business deployments, I mean, 
candidly to the team's credit, like that's why we're having this conversation. Like they've built something really special and they've built the marketing and the framing around how does this feel like almost like a Nike-esque experience um, that I wanted, I want to be in queue to get. And I, if I don't get it, I'm kind of wondering why wasn't I tapped on the shoulder to have a better up coach? Yeah. yeah I, I would, I would say we interestingly sit in between these two, uh, you know, on, on one side. So, you know, we're in the mid teens in terms of enterprise engagement and it varies depending on employee employer size. So smaller, the employer, higher, the engagement, mm-hmm. easier to communicate more homogenous audience the larger the employer, it's, you know, more heterogeneous audience. You're, you know, you're, like in Delta Airlines, you're talking to baggage handlers and you're talking to back office folks and you're talking to flight attendants. So messaging has to be different to get people engaged. Um, but we, we look at this as being all about behavior change, right? So ultimately what we're trying to do, and we started this year, we're, we're trying to change behaviors so that people can ultimately take care of themselves. So they ultimately build resilience. They have self-care routines. They learn how to meditate, have exercise routines. They learn how to eat well and, and, and um, improve, improve over time. So in an ideal world, we would see everybody for as long as they need to build those habits, to have that behavior change ingrained in what they do and then they'd move on and we'd be able to continue to support the next people. Now, it turns out that not everybody's like that. And so, you know, 20% of our members are longitudinal more than a year and they love that ch- touch point and they wanna continue to work with their coach. That's fine, right? That's great. Some are more episodic. Some are gonna come in and they're gonna work for an intense few months learn what they need to learn, they'll move on. They might come back when there's something that changes in their life or they fall off of this habit that they've built and they wanna, they wanna tune up, so to speak. Some are, you know, they want that checkpoint with the coach. They want that three month period where they're learning a new set of skills and then we don't see them again. And I think all of those are very valid approaches to, to improvement and, and, you know, everybody's a little bit different. We had some questions here. Um, I don't know. I can't find um, Dan. I don't know if you wanted to ask that question, but I'll ask a quick one um, as people raise their hands or um, get ready with a question. But how about marketing? Um, Alon, you do a lot of marketing. What's the best B to C way to market? Yeah. Um, so we're active in in, in multiple channels, uh, um, and you know all the usual suspects of. Uh, paid social in and search, whether it's paid or SEO. And then we have podcasts and we have TV and we have radio and, and billboards and, and partnerships and collaborations with other sites and apps and, and everyone who speak with consumers. So um, uh, marketing is very broad. I would say though, the therapy is one of the, um, not only, but one of the very few sectors where you have um, both people that are actively interested in that, like there are people who are looking for a therapist, looking for the therapy or online therapy every day in the hundreds of thousands. Uh, but then you also have uh, the passive people. So you have people who actually know that they need therapy for sometimes a decade, but haven't got to the point and the courage to uh, do something about it. So we're in one of the sectors that uh, just by putting the messaging out there in a very, very broad way, we can attract a lot of people, which is a little bit, I, I was like, it, it's another point in my life, I was in the uh, moving business and moving is, is the other extreme. Like if you're not moving now, uh, I'm not going to convince you to hire a mover uh, and you're going to move every four or five years. Uh, therapy is much similar to weight loss or, or dating where most people or a lot of people need it and wanted it, not necessarily doing anything about it. So you can go with a very broad marketing uh, strategy and, and channel mix and still hit a lot of people who are interested in that. Okay, I, I see Dan, but I do have one last question. And this is for pretty much every, everyone in terms of the, the therapist, it seems like every, they're really in demand or even coaches, but what's your value proposition? Are they making more money at your companies than if they were standalone and, and working for themselves and how much money are they making an hour? 
at your company? But what, how are you attracting them? Because it seems like everyone wants to curate all of these therapists and coaches. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in first. Um, you know, our approach has been different, I think, from most in the mental health startup world. We're full-time employing almost all of our therapists. And I think, you know, the average person thinks about a therapist. They think about that for that person in a solo private practice. It turns out most therapists aren't in that setting. You know, most therapists work for health systems, community mental health agencies, and schools. Most people want to be part of a team. They want stability. They want a career. They want investment in professional development. And what we've built at Two Chairs is basically a best-in-class kind of career offering for therapists. We pay folks really well. We give them great benefits. Um, you know, we're investing in their professional development, their wellness, their self-care, and they benefit from innovative clinical programs. So matching at Two Chairs benefits clients. It also benefits therapists who have their own uh, preferences. They have their own professional development goals. And we've found that that package is, is really appealing. Um, and look, there are therapists out there that love autonomy. They love private practice. We struggle to attract those types. And um, I, I think, you know, models like BetterHelp are probably more appealing to someone. Look into stitch together hours from a few different places. For us, it's all about folks that want to build a career. Great. Yeah, I definitely agree with uh, that. We, we got to completely different uh, conclusion because our therapist yes. has 99s. And, uh, but I, I definitely agree with, uh, with uh, the misconception that Alex uh, is, is spending. And, and that's, you know, us living, I'm, I live in the Bay Area and we have this mental picture of a therapist who make $300 an hour and, and have a, a, a full calendar booked uh, weeks, uh, weeks ahead. That may be true for a very small fraction of therapists. Uh, the actual median pay of therapists in the US is $48,000. Um, and, and that goes like to $22 to $24 uh, an hour. Uh, we pay considerably more than that. And yes, there are therapists who are uh, using BetterHelp and, and other platforms like ours just to augment what they do in community mental health or in their private practice. Uh, we do have some full-timers and um, I think that there's a room for both models. Those, those are looking for um, uh, more, like Alex said, more autonomy and more flexibility. And those are looking for more stability and, and steady uh, income. Sandy, did you want to answer that or I was going to get to Yeah, that? I think yeah. I really employ our therapists as well. So I'd just say a lot, of, a lot of the same things around career development. I'd say the only two things we think about are sustainable caseloads. Uh, that's a really yeah. challenging thing to, to kind of uh, accept insurance and, and kind of maintain sustainable caseloads and um, diversity of, of client population. You know, we are over time, that's part of the reason we're, we're focusing on access, not just for clients, but to give providers the ability to kind of serve more folks than might traditionally access care. Yeah, that's, that was my other additional question to you, Bambi, is that how do you protect providers from burnout? Because, you know, of course you're moving fast, scaling, and I believe uh, that's a question both for Russell and Alexi. And if in the next you know, minute, if you could answer that, that would be awesome. Five seconds. Five seconds. <laughs> Solve for the provider yeah, I mean, burnout, please. Thank you. It's a different model on the coaching oh. side. So we, we are similar. We're yield management, right? They're selling us unsold inventory and they want the flexibility similar to Elon. So burnout's not actually a consideration. Our average coach is not doing 40 hours a week on the platform. Um, so they, you know, by definition are giving us time that they aren't filling in their private practice and they they would like to fill and they'd like to have flexibility, right? Maybe they want to be in Hawaii and doing the coaching session and FaceTime. Mm -hmm. um, so we keep very modest loads, of course, for quality of care, but we've been fortunate and just how our economic model works, we haven't had to worry uh, as much about burnout on the practice side. And practice yeah, we, we are, we're, we're full-time as well. So we employ our, our coaches full-time and actually the majority of our therapists and clinicians full-time as well. Mm -hmm. And it's a critical issue that we focus on. Uh, in fact, we recently moved the coaches to a four day work week uh, to mm -hmm. make sure that they have plenty of recovery time between the, the work that they're doing during those four days. And, and that's been a hugely well-received uh, change for us. Excellent, thank you. So Dan wanted to ask a question. So I, you know, I wanna make sure we're opening this up. So quickly, Dan, please ask a question to the panelists. Yeah, thank you everybody for all your great contributions here on the panel and also in the world. Um, one comment, and I can add color to it later about 
uh, health coaches. I think that there is a missing position in society, and that is of the expert generalists in lifestyle health. Obviously, it's a huge factor in the cost of our healthcare system, and there is no formal training system that allows a person to enter in to some training program that makes them equivalent to a primary care doctor, but in lifestyle medicine or lifestyle health. So I can add color to that later. Uh, the questions here, though, are what are the different categories of levers that are being utilized to promote mental resilience? We hear about that. Uh, I'd love to hear different opinions about how you are promoting, promoting this important uh, function. So should we begin, uh, Russell, can you, can you start with that? Mental resilience. Yeah, I, I, to be honest, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, yeah, what are the different ways you are promoting mental resilience? What are the different categories that you're leveraging? Got it. Um, so yeah, well, and I'll start with your comment. Uh, you know, so our, our behavioral health coaches are the vast majority of the time certified. So there, there actually is education on behavioral health coaching. There are wonderful certificate programs from like Duke University, UCLA has got a great program. Columbia has got a program. Michigan's got a program. So there's quite a few of them out there uh, that are doing a great job certifying these coaches and, and teaching them these skills. So um, I think more of that's coming as well. Uh, on, on your question, our, our you know, interventions range from, uh, first of all, starting with understanding what are the needs uh, motivational interviewing is a huge part of what our behavioral health coaches do. So they're really trying to help someone take that next step or set of steps, uh, smart goal setting, capital S-M-A-R-T goal setting to uh, enable them to build a plan and help them stick to that plan. We have mindfulness and meditation is a big part of how we help to create um, uh, lifestyle change. We use breathing exercises. So a lot of what we pull over from, you know, the learnings of Eastern medicine, and we see the popularity and the calm and the headspace of those types of exercises. Lifestyle change is important. So sleep habits is uh, a huge part of how we get people back on the right track. Is if you don't sleep well, then you're going to have trouble with any of the rest of it because you don't have the mechanisms because your, your, your body needs that sleep. Your mind needs that sleep to be more effective. Um, eating habits, exercise habits, all create a positive feedback loop. Uh, and then again, using that smart, smart goal setting to start to talk about, well, what are we really trying to accomplish? And then building the tool set. We've used the gym analogy a lot, just like a gym coach will help you understand what those exercises do and how to build a routine around those exercises. And then finally, it'll hold you accountable to accomplish those exercises. Same thing, right? The, the mental health coaches are working with you to understand what are the, what are the exercises? What are the, the interventions we can use together? Let's set a plan on how to use those the right way. And then they're gonna hold you accountable for actually executing. That's great. I don't think we can really have anyone else answer any more questions because it's 1237. So I'm so sorry, it's too late. But I will say that we do have extended breakout sessions on June 9th and July 14th for 90 minutes. Some of these speakers will be on those calls. Um, I want to thank everyone on this call. I also want to mention that we didn't talk about offline or in-person therapy, which I think is important. Russ just mentioned gym memberships. I mean, I know a lot of people are on Pelotons and working out at home, but it's also really nice to be social and going to the gym. I think that we're forgetting that in-person is actually really important. So for services like Octave Health and Two Chairs, I think that they're really positioned to build that out as well. Um, having that in-person component. I, I wanted to dive into that a little bit, but I just wanted to make sure that we all knew that that was actually pretty significant and, and we might be missing the boat if we're not thinking about what in-person is going to look like. Um, so with that, I just want to say thanks, Russ. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sandeep. Thank thanks, Alexi. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alon. Um, hopefully you guys will stick around. And um, if, if not, we will we'll see you on another Zoom call. Uh, thank you for so much for all your insight and thank you for everything that you're doing for society. Thanks, Bambi. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Take care all. Thank, thank you. you so much for having so many options for our patients, for sure. Take care.